Make a model. Hi, I'm Stephanie Yu, and this is an Apatosaurus. Of course it's not a real one, but it's not a toy either. It's a model. People took a lot of what they know about dinosaurs and put it in this model. In fact, this model is the same shape as the real Apatosaurus, but a lot smaller. 64,000 times smaller, actually. If I were 64,000 times smaller, I'd be about this big. Ah! A model is a tool. You can't hammer nails with it, but you can use it to figure out stuff. I bet I can figure out how much the real Apatosaurus weighed by using this model. The only thing I have to do is figure out what to do. I know. I'll weigh this Apatosaurus and multiply the weight by 64,000. Okay, this Apatosaurus weighs about one half pound. Half of 64,000, that's 32,000 pounds. That's a lot. This thing was gigantic. No wonder you ran away. But there's a problem. Plastic. This thing is plastic. Real animals, even ones that became extinct millions of years ago, are made out of flesh and bones, just like me. And plastic and flesh and bones weigh different amounts. So I can't just use the weight of this plastic model. Looks like I have to figure out another way to figure this out. Hmm. Well, while I'm figuring this out, David visited some scientists at Aero Environment in California who needed lots of models to help their project get off the ground. See how many you see. Okay, let's point the head out uh, away from the shop. I got a left feet. Feet. They go at the back. Feet. This is a full scale model of a flying animal that lived over 60 million years ago. The people at Aero Environment in California have already gotten a model half this size to fly. The animal is a pterodactyl. Now, not much is known about it, except for the fact that it wasn't a bird, and yet it flew. And it was big. How did its designers get started? David, would you like to well, take these bones? Martin Cowley, one of the team leaders, gave me the answer. Martin, bones. How can you be sure what the, the bones of the extinct like? animal. You only have bits and pieces of bones here. Yes, it's really been a, a detective story for the paleontologists working on this project to piece together all the evidence they can find. And what you see here is literally all that exists of this giant pterodactyl. These are the real bones? These are actually exact copies of the fossils and you can see there are even here some pieces missing that they haven't yet found. How are they able to know how long this piece was that, you know, that they put in? Well, luckily they found complete skeletons of about a dozen young pterodactyls, 18 feet wingspan. Yeah, I can show you some of the models that we've built up here on the shelf. What's this one? This is a typical model that has a, a wing and a stabilizing surface at the back and as you can see a propeller would go around to thrust it through the air. By comparison there's a flying model of a pterodactyl we made here that uses a rubber band and on this one it's the wings that flap up and down and this is what provides propulsion here. So to build a model of a pterodactyl that actually flew must have been incredibly difficult. Yes, it's really such a difficult problem that we had to break it down and make a series of models of which this was one of the first to help solve each different stage. This is one of the first of a series Many tests of on different models, models were done before a final version was ready to fly. Unlike birds of today, the QN didn't have a tail. So one of the first experiments we did was to take a regular model aeroplane where the tail is used to control pitch. Which is going up and down, right? That's correct. And we removed that and tried to find out whether we could just use the wings 
swinging backwards and forwards the way nature does to control the pitch of the model. Like uh, bats and other birds. That's exactly right. If you'd like to pass me the transmitter, sure. I can demonstrate how this works. Moving the transmitter backwards and forwards, you'll notice the wings sweep fore and aft. They go back and forth. Yes, and that's just exactly the same principle that uh, birds use today when they're gliding. If you notice them, you'll see their wings swing backwards and forwards, and that action really takes the place of a tailplane. So you were able to fly this glider without a tail? Yes, and until we'd done it, we didn't really know it would be possible, so we built a very simple model that would enable us to see if this idea worked. So you started off simple, and you found out that you could fly without a tail, and then you moved on to your next problem. That's right. What was that? Uh, the other problem I can show you is one of side-to-side -side turning. Okay, great. Now, these wings don't move. No, the previous model had moving wings, which taught us how to solve the problems of pitch control. That's up and down. Yes, and this model just has the head moving, which helped us solve the problems of yaw. What's yaw? Well, yaw is the side-to-side -side motion of the model. Later, the final model was complete with wings that flapped and a head that turned. Before the first flight, they did a wind tunnel test without the tunnel. Left, right. Forward, aft. A last check of the controls and it was time to launch. The wheels were jettisoned and the half-sized pterodactyl flew. I had a chance to fly a pterodactyl myself, with a little help from Alec Brooks, one of the designers. What we have, have here, David, is a simulation of the flight of the pterodactyl. You can see we have the pterodactyl with its wings spread out and mm -hmm. a head that can turn from side to side. Above it, we have a line on the screen that shows the direction of the incoming wind. Sort oh, of, I was wondering what that was. You can see some, some turbulence in the air, like a gust of wind might come from the side or something like this. You can see that as this pterodactyl is flying along, it's moving its head from side to side. It's not doing that just to look around. It's actually using that head the way an airplane uses its tail, uh, tail surfaces. This, unlike an airplane, has its... Uh, tail surface up in the front where that would ordinarily make it quite unstable if you have a big surface in the front it tends to want to make it flip around backwards mm -hmm. so the animal uses its brain to actually turn its head and keep himself pointing straight when we made our replica of the pterodactyl we had to substitute for the animal's actual brain so we actually built an electronic brain that would control the head on the replica with some motors it's an autopilot that's right it is an autopilot if i turn off the autopilot in the computer, we'll see what happens. I can push this button over here, watch what happens. It can't fly without its intelligence on. If I'm careful, I can steer this head so that it's always sort of pointing into the wind and correcting any any upset that it's getting. I don't, whoops, I'm falling off right now. You, it's, it's hard to do, but you can learn it with a little practice. Give it a try? Yeah, try it. Okay, to help you fly it, if you keep the tip of the beak pointed right at the line showing the wind, you'll probably be able to stay upright. Your own brain can adapt and learn just the way the pterodactyl ah. did. Hey, I'm flying a pterodactyl. There were many kinds of pterodactyls. The skies were probably filled with them. Animals so successful, they survived on Earth for more than a hundred million years. Sixty million years ago, they vanished. Pterodactyls may have mysteriously disappeared, but you can't get rid of me that easily. I've come up with something. How do you weigh a dinosaur when it's long gone? Use the model to help figure out its volume. Volume is the amount of space something takes up. Knowing the volume of something helps you figure out its weight. I'll show you how. I love this job. 
I'm going to get into this bathtub filled with water. When I get in, part of the water will be pushed out into that tub. I just pushed out takes up the same amount of space that I do. It has the same volume, but there's more to it than that. Water also weighs something. In this bucket is the water that I just pushed out of the bathtub. The water with the same volume that I have. The water and the bucket weigh 115 pounds. We need to subtract three pounds for the weight of the bucket. The water weighs 112 pounds. I weigh 110 pounds. See? Water with the same volume as me weighs just about the same as me. Water weighs about the same as flesh and bones. And animals, including dinosaurs, are made out of flesh and bones. So if I use water to figure out a dinosaur's volume, I can also use that water to figure out its weight. Now, if you think I'm going to try to get a patasaurus into a bathtub, you're crazy. Besides, they're extinct. No, I'm going to use my dinosaur model. I put the model into this tank. The water that's pushed out has the same volume as the model. Now, this water weighs one pound, two ounces. That's one and one eighth pound. So if this model were made out of flesh and bones, it would weigh one and one eighth pounds. It would be a teeny tiny little apatosaurus. But the real apatosaurus was 64,000 times bigger than this model. So if I multiply the weight of the water by 64,000, I'll know how much the real apatosaurus weighed. 64,000 times 1 and 1 eighth pounds, that's 72,000 pounds. That's over 36 tons. The real apatosaurus weighed about 36 tons. Yikes! If I saw that coming, I'd run away. Models are one kind of tool that you can use to figure out things. If you have a complicated problem, like how a pterodactyl flew, you can build and test a series of models to find out what you need to know. If you have a question, like how much a dinosaur weighed, you can use a model to help figure out the answer. Three to One Classroom Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. To purchase video cassettes and a teacher's guide for programs in this series, call 800-228-4630.